Welcome everyone. Today we have a guest on our podcast. Today we have Sahil Lavinga from Gumroad. He is in fact the founder of Gumroad and for those of you who are unfamiliar with Gumroad, Gumroad is the Amazon for digital products and I've been using Gumroad for the past 3 years now and it is the best platform out there if you're trying to sell anything digital like an ebook or a comic book or a course or some kind of teaching product or anything that is software a image and things of that sort so how are you doing sahil i'm doing great i'm super excited to to talk to you as a as a long time fan and follower and um yeah i'm excited to have this book come out soon and gumroad's going swimmingly there's a lot of cool stuff that we're working on so uh november 2021 and 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 onwards are going to be pretty pretty exciting uh for for anyone who uses the product hopefully that's good to hear so recently sahil has written a book called the minimalist entrepreneur and sahil can you tell us more about your book it releases totally. tomorrow by the way yes tomorrow um yeah i can, totally can so it's called the minimalist entrepreneur and it's it's really a book uh that i wanted to write to explain how anyone can start their own business uh i think you know you talk about this a lot like i think sort of this this kind of financial independence like one of the one of the best ways to do it is to kind of you know become a creator and become an entrepreneur and 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 can kind of control your distribution and and control you know the way that you make money and all these sorts of things um and yeah i wanted to kind of write a book that uh that anyone can read like my mom could read and 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 figure out oh this is what a business is this is what it looks like this is what i have to do to start one to scale one to hire people um basically everything from sort of beginning to end i really wanted to write a book um that was kind of like a playbook you know like if you want to start your own little small business uh, and i always think it's important to kind of start small you can always go big over time um i wanted to write a book that kind of answered those sorts of questions um and it kind of came actually from i wrote this blog post a couple years back called reflecting on my failure to build a billion dollar company about gumroad's ups and downs and penguin reached out at, after reading that post an editor from penguin random house saying hey this is great you seem like you know how to write um you know would you want to write a book on this kind of these topics around sort of lean entrepreneurship and sort of not sort of necessarily the kind of billion dollar unicorn chasing venture capital raising uh machine but like you know uh, and 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 i think you know venture is fine i'm not sort of anti venture necessarily but i do think it's not super accessible to most people oh no right? let's, let's uh, not skip the line because venture is a later stage thing I'll, i will first like to yeah. ask you for example sure. if you take someone who's still in college or let's say someone who's 18 years old what mm-hmm. where should he start if he wants to become a tech entrepreneur like you what are yeah. the things he needs to learn where should he begin and just to give people a bit more background on sahil Sahil was the first employee at Pinterest and he started Gumroad all on his own it almost failed and then it was successful again so Sahil has a pretty good eye on what it's like to be an employee at a startup and also run a startup so Sahil what skills does someone who is 18 and say fresh out of college doesn't know anything or no fresh out of high school and doesn't know anything what should he start with Yeah, I mean I think, you know, the the sort of first skill that I think everyone should learn is um how to write. I think and and you know, eventually hopefully that means writing a little bit of code or at least getting familiar with that. Um especially if kind of you're young and you have that inclination, I highly recommend it. But in the beginning is just learn to write, learn to figure out how you think, um how to communicate with other people, how to persuade other folks. Um you know, start tweeting, start building an audience. um start trying to come up with your own thoughts read a lot of books um and you'll get there you'll you'll start to have like really interesting ideas you'll start to be able to connect the dots in ways that no one has before which is like pretty cool um that that's even possible with 7 billion people like it's you can still find interesting insights that it feels like no one has yet tweeted right um so i think that's kind of a great place to start um and then so, learn to build stuff um is the other thing i would say is like learn notion learn figma there are all these amazing tools that exist today that allow anyone really to build uh you know a business and now there are kind of all these you know payment offerings like gumroad and stripe and and ptm and all these these things that you can use to accept payments and so start you know start charging money for something right like it doesn't even really matter what but i think it'll train you um in a lot of really healthy habits around sales marketing 
And then when you, you know, over time scale to, you know, you have a, an idea for a business and you, you, you know, you build it and, and you hire other people, all of those skills will, will be pretty, pretty darn important. Um, so how much code does someone need to know to start a startup in tech? Do they need to be an expert? Do they need to know everything? Do they need a computer science degree? Or do they just need to do some courses with Free Code Camp and get started? Like what does someone need to know there? And yeah, I would also love it if you could recommend particular courses that you found the most useful in your journey. Totally. Yeah, so you, you definitely don't need a CS degree. Uh, I don't have a CS degree myself. And... I think Free Code Camp is great. Um, I it kind of came out after I had kind of learned most of this stuff, um, so I'm not super familiar with Free Code Camp specifically. But I used a course, for example, called CS uh, 193P, which is a, a Stanford course on iTunes University um, that basically was about iOS development, iPhone development back in the day. And you know, it was it's free. There, all the stuff is free. You can you can. You know, imagine like paying fifty thousand dollars a year to take this course, which is what people do, <laughs> right? Like, and a, and a couple other courses, right? But like, you it's free. You can go online, all the homework, all the assignments, it's all there. Um, they give it all away for free. Uh, the best schools in the world do this now, uh, and so yeah, we kind of just start googling around. You know, I think it. I think that course gets you started, and then I think the important thing to get to is to have an idea, right? I think a lot of people say, "Oh, I want to learn to code," right? And it's like, okay, well, what does that mean? Right, like, what do you want to build? I think that's the important question. Uh, what do you want to build? If if you say, okay, I want to build a to do list app on my iPhone, right? I forget about is this a good business or not. Like, just learn to build. Then you know, just Google how to build a to do list app on iPhone, and I bet you that there's a tutorial out there uh, that is specifically for that, right? And you will fail and you will run into problems, like everyone does. Um, but I think you kind of have to start then learn, uh, is kind of what, what I often say, instead of sort of try to learn as much as possible, read a bunch of books and then start like you will, you know, the best way to learn is to just kind of start and then figure it out. Right. Um, but I think for me, at least I'm very motivated by this kind of visual in my head of a product that yet, you know, it doesn't yet exist. Right. Like I don't get excited by coding. Right. I don't get excited. I think this is kind of some sort of a misconception that people have about engineers is that we love to code. <laughs> and you know, we, I, I enjoy it for sure. But like, I, I think the satisfaction comes from actually building a, a product that people can use and pay for and get value from. And so you kind of want to work backwards, I think, from what is the idea you want to build? It might be as simple as like a job board, right? Or it might be as simple as like a, it might even be a no code solution, right? You might not even have to write any code. You can use, you can go to like makerpad.co and learn all these tutorials to plug Zapier into Webflow into you know, uh, Airtable and Notion and Figma and like build all these sorts of tools. Um, you don't need to necessarily learn how to code and you can always kind of accessorize, you know, your no code sort of pipeline with, with code over time as you, as you feel like you need to learn those things. I will say, even if you, you know, don't want to become an engineer yourself, I think having some familiarity with code is helpful, right? Just in terms of hiring people, I think it's super helpful. That makes a lot of sense. So if someone who is 18 and, you know, when, when they hear something like you have to have an idea, most people don't have an idea yet. So they can mm -hmm. still learn how to code. So is there a particular language that you would recommend them? Because that's, even though it's not super relevant, which language to start with, it is the most frequent question people tend to have about learning how to code. So what yeah. language do you think someone should start with? Yeah, that's a good question. I think the, you know, the language that I would start with personally is Ruby, Ruby on Rails, just because I think, and maybe that's just a bias that I have, but I do think uh, if you're trying to build a web application, the sort of most accessible thing to me is to build a Ruby on Rails application, just the demo app, like figure out how to deploy the demo app probably to something like Heroku. Um, and you'll have like a website, you know, with a URL and a domain that people can visit and it'll load. And, you know, I think that's a great way to start. And there's, there's a lot of, you know, it's, it's a sort of an ecosystem Ruby on Rails. So there's just a ton of tutorials and examples and libraries and things that you can kind of plug into over time. I think if you want to build iPhone apps, I think Swift, uh, learning, learning Swift is, is a great place to start. Um, those, th that's kind of what I would recommend. I think a lot of people would also recommend potentially like front end, JavaScript, React. I find that that stuff's really hard. 
it's really complicated. It's, there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of moving, you know, a lot of moving components. I think the way that I kind of think about it is when you're learning Ruby on rails, you're, you're building for a single server, right? Like you're, you're, you know, and then people are visiting that server, like that website versus with JavaScript, you're kind of building for everybody else's computer, right? All this code runs on their computer. Um, and so I think it's just a lot trickier. There's a lot more edge cases to think about. Um, and so, yeah, I find that like, if you start with Ruby on rails, you kind of learn a little bit of JavaScript and jQuery. And then over time you might learn react or next JS is really popular now. Um, but, uh, but uh, yeah, I think, you know, I think starting, starting really simple with rails is a great way to kind of learn about, you know, schema database, you know, application layer routing, like all, all of this sort of basics. And I actually have a bunch of YouTube videos now, 15 hours worth of content where I build an application from scratch using Ruby on rails integrate Stripe, do payments, like literally from zero to making, you know, my first dollar. Um, and so it's, it's there and there's, there's tons and tons of tutorials that you can go find. There's a great, if you just Google, like making a blog in rails, uh, there's a bunch of great YouTube tutorials. So, you know, it'll take you a few hours, um, and you'll have a blog, you know, that's your own. You can do whatever you want with it. Um, you don't have to pay anyone for hosting, you know, it's your thing, uh, which I think is pretty, pretty cool, right? In the vein of kind of the sovereign individual, I think it's kind of a healthy thing. Even if you don't want to learn how to code, I think it's a healthy thing to know um, how to do, right? Even if you may not need to do it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's interesting that I've never come across your video on coding and setting up integrations with payment processing and everything. So I will be linking Mm -hmm. that in the description of this podcast. So let's say that someone, oh, by the way, if someone wants to learn Ruby on Rails, uh, there is a pretty interesting resource called the Odin Project that you should check out. And if someone wants to learn things like React, there's a course called Full Stack Open by Helsinki University. It's available online for free. So people who are interested, they can check these courses out. So... Sahil, let's say that someone has a good idea. They've learned how to code. They've started their app. And this is actually the case with a friend of mine where he has, well, he is a programmer. He is a very good programmer. He's worked with the, what do you call it? Fang people. And Mm -hmm. I gave him an idea for a startup and he's like, I could build it. This is a pretty good idea, but I would have no idea how to get customers. So what is your advice on getting your first few customers? Where do you begin with the whole promotions? Yeah. I mean, I think the, the, the place to start is with your friends and family, right. And, in, in sort of startup land, they call it your, you know, your first round of funding, your friends and family round. And ultimately like when you are new and, and no one knows who you are, I think you kind of have to focus on, well, who does know who you are, right? Like who did you go to school with? Who are your friends? Who are your family? Like who are your neighbors? Who's in your physical, you know, community, uh, start with the people who know you, uh, because they'll use your product because they trust you versus, you know, the inherent value of the product. Um, and then I think, you know, I, you know, g- generally I would like to, you know, I would like to sort of recommend building with somebody in mind. So you kind of have that already when you, when you have something to show, but I think, you know, just spend time on all the social networks on Instagram, Twitter, et cetera, and try to sort of find who has this problem that you're trying to solve and who feels that pain point the most, right? Like who would benefit the most from learning about, your thing. And it's, it's funny, like a lot of people ask me like, Oh, how did you find the first like hundred customers for Gumroad? And they kind of expect some growth hack or some like marketing channel or some SEO content marketing strategy. And I, no, it was like, I would literally just like spend time on the internet trying to find people who were selling digital files on their website in some terrible way using PayPal and manual emails and, and just emailing them, literally finding their email one by one and saying, Hey, I, you know, I built this thing called Gumroad. It helps you sell digital files really easy. It kind of automates all this stuff. So you don't have to think about it anymore. Uh, and that was it, you know, just doing that every day, you know, kind of day after day for months, you know, that's kind of how a lot of businesses get started. Um, and so I think, I think that's kind of the important thing is to sort of cold email, cold DM, cold call, I guess, you know, uh, could potentially work, but I, I, I really focus on cold emails to, you know, very personalized, not copy pasted, um, to people who I think would really benefit from, from this problem that I've, I've solved. And I always try to solve my own problem. So I have some credibility there, right? I can always say, Hey, I had this problem that you have, um, and I solved it for myself. And maybe, maybe this thing, you know, can also solve your problem. Right. And I think that's a very kind of very convincing, uh, sales pitch. I see that's very interesting. And it also makes a lot of sense. 
one thing I want to ask you is that, see, what you explained is a pretty cool idea. And that works if you're like a solo founder. And I've been watching some videos from something called Y Combinator. And it seems like they seem to prefer people who have a co-founder with them. So what are your thoughts on this? Do you think it is good to have a co-founder? And since you're a solo founder, do you think that you have missed out on something by not having someone to help you with the project? Yeah, I think, you know, there's a lot of opinions about having a co-founder or being a solo founder and definitely Y Combinator and Paul Graham are very sort of, May you know I would almost say anti solo founder right um, where they're they they really kind of discourage it um, and you know I would say that you know one reason to discourage it is that it just adds a filter right if you say hey solo founders can apply to Y Combinator guess what everybody's a solo founder right <laughs> uh, everyone's a single human being so you now have seven billion solo founders out there um, there's no there's no bar but if you say hey we need co-founders then you you know it, it at least shows that you were able to convince one other person to work on this idea with you right um, and so I you know I, th- I think that's fine I think a lot of people don't ever want to be solo founders uh, but I do think like some of the best investments I've made personally had a solo founder it was run by effectively one person and even the companies that have multiple co-founders there's generally one person who's kind of clearly at the helm of the company they may be the CEO. They're making most of the decisions. They're the public face of the company. And, and this kind of, you know, Steve Jobs with Apple, Bill Gates with Microsoft, right? Like, the, you know, Zuck with Facebook, right? Like, these are all effectively, in my view, basically solo founders. Uh, and, uh, and you know, you do need help, right? Um, and you can certainly give a bunch of equity to your early employees. And you can, you know, potentially even call them, you know, founding employees, part of the founding team, co-founders. Um, but I think... You know, I, I, I do get worried sometimes that people think that they need co-founders, right? Um, and I'm just kind of a solitary person. Like I like, you know, I like just doing stuff kind of by myself. And, uh, you know, I don't co-write my Twitter account or anything, you know, anything like that. And so I think, you know, for me, my preference is to kind of start and build my own things. And um, and if someone, you know, wants to start a company and I really want to help them, then I'll just invest and, you know, help them kind of from a distance. And I find that that's just my preference. And I think I have that leverage now because I've shown people that, you know, you can be successful as a solo founder and even frankly doing other things at the same time. Um, But I think a lot of people don't have that leverage when they're beginning, right? They kind of have to to kind of fall into the, into the kind of the, the, the framework that people want them to, to fall into. Um, I do think I have missed out on stuff, right? Like no doubt about it. There's certain things that, you know, you can go out and recruit or raise money while your co-founder is managing the team. But I would say that, the benefit of being a solo founder is that it forces you to hire very, very, very well, right? Because effectively, you can only be in one place at one time. So you're either hiring or managing, right? You can't kind of do both. And so you have to hire like very, very high quality, self sort of motivated, self managing, autonomous kind of people. And I think everyone should be doing that, frankly, right? Even if you have seven co founders. But the truth is that doesn't happen. Right. Uh, if you know that you're going to be able to manage these folks, it, it sort of makes you more comfortable. Uh, and so I think that was a healthy, a healthy thing for me. It's like I, I, I just kind of had to operate this way forever. And it really helped when Gumroad had the downturn and, and even when we did started doing well. And now I balance Gumroad with this new book and with my sort of venture stuff. I think being a solo founder really trained me in sort of that, you know, time delegation and uh, not time delegation, effort delegation, people delegation, right? Like all these ways of outsourcing um, and trusting other people, um, which I think a lot of founders struggle with, right? Like they they hire all these people, but then they don't really let them be creative. Um, and ultimately, if you want to scale your business, like that's how you scale the business, right? Is you basically allow other people to kind of take your judgment abilities and apply it on their own. Hmm. So how do you hire a good employee? What do you look for and what are the things that you want to avoid? Yeah, I I think uh, a really simple heuristic is someone who wants to start a company someday. Because I find that those folks are very entrepreneurial, very self-motivated, very self-managing. They're thinking about things in terms of the business logic, right? Like, why are we shipping this feature? It's not just to ship the feature. It's so that creators, for example, can make more money, right? Or can save more time. Uh, or can stop dealing with this annoying thing that happens with Gumroad or saves them a click or, or what have you, right? But th- trying to get, I'm always looking for people who are thinking about the business 
um, and and thinking about the product, not just you know engineers who are thinking about code, right? Ultimately, you know we're in service of our customers, and and ultimately it doesn't really matter like how our how clean our code is necessarily. It's how you know what can the product allow our our users to do, and so I'm always trying to find people who who know that, who are really excited about building product, shipping code. Uh, not just kind of like, you know, there are a lot of engineers who just love writing code, right? Those people also exist. Um, and generally, I would say that those people would do really well at Google or Facebook where they can work on like a really hard technical problem, right? And get excited about that. And I have, you know, a friend at Twitter who's just super excited about that kind of stuff. Um, Gumroad's not the place <laughs> for that, right? Um, I think Gumroad's the place if you want to learn how to build a product so you can start your own product someday. And so I really try to optimize for hiring those kinds of people. And frankly, like I try to scare off the other folks, right? Because I don't want to waste my time talking to them and I don't want them to waste their time talking to me if it's not going to be a fit. Um, I would say the other thing that I look for, um, which is more specific to Gumroad, but I think with remote work and asynchronous work will become more common is people, you know, kind of like what I said in the beginning, uh, people who can write really, really well and can communicate their ideas really, really well with each other. Because ultimately, you know, this sort of feedback loop can get quite expensive, right? If you say, hey, I have this idea and I have some thoughts on it, you know, a day later, and then you come back with some more thoughts on my thoughts, like two days later, and, it, you know, three weeks in, we're still discussing, right? And, it, and I, I, I try to find people who are really good at kind of almost predicting the kind of questions I would have the first time around and answering them ahead of time. Um, and it's, a, it's kind of a different skill set um, than writing code, right? Being able to communicate your ideas. But I do think there's sort of some correlation there where I, I, some of the best engineers I've ever met are just phenomenal writers. Like they just can communicate their ideas really well. And I think if that means that if they can communicate ideas really well, then they can take a complex problem, break it down into its component parts. And ultimately, you know, that's not too different from, from you know, building, building a product and writing code to do that. Hmm, makes sense. I think people usually stereotype engineers as people who are bad at communication. But I bet there are engineers out there who are pretty good at it. And Sahil has this. See, it seems like you have found some, haven't you? Yeah, totally. You know, it's not easy necessarily. Um, we have to kind of search the globe for them. and But we have dozens of them at this point. You know, we probably have 20 or 30 engineers at Gumroad who have this have this feeling where they, they can write code really well. Of course, that's kind of a necessary thing. But they also have soft skills. They can communicate really well. Um, they know how to share their ideas. They can kind of, it's almost like body language in a way, but it's like kind of virtual body language. Like they just know how to, you know, feel, make everyone feel good and have positive energy and, and, um, and they, they exist. And I think it is kind of a learnable skill, right? Just like code, just like writing, uh, just, you know, you can learn how to communicate. You can learn how to, how to sort of consolidate your ideas, um, and I think part of the exciting thing about Gumroad is you get feedback on your ideas. So, you know, ideally it's the kinds of people who want to get better at that skill that will join Gumroad, right? Because that's a lot of the value they get is, oh, Sahil's going to be looking at my work and critiquing it um, so that I can kind of improve, you know, at writing, et cetera. So at this point, Gumroad is pretty mature. I would say you have a good product, lots of customers. How much time does it take you to manage the company? And how do you manage your employees, given that you have 20 employees, you're writing a book, you wrote a book, you're managing a VC fund now. So how do you manage it all? How do you ensure that all the employees are actually working, especially that they're now that they're working by work from home? Yeah, yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. I think ultimately, you know, I kind of just, I just observe the output, right? Like I, you know, and sometimes this means that the feedback loop is slower, but I really just say, you know, if you're shipping code, then you're doing great, right? If you're improving, what I say is if you're creating value for our creators and there's an obvious paper trail of you doing that, right? It may be answering support tickets. If you're a support person, it may be writing internal documentation so we can be more efficient as a team. It may mean building a new product feature or fixing a bug, but there should be a clear paper trail, evidence, objective. Anyone can see it and agree that it exists, um, you know, in a, uh, in, you know, on a, on a weekly, at least basis, right. Uh, there should be sort of a very clear, and it should almost be kind of like undeniable. Like I shouldn't even have to think about it. Um, and this is kind of why I try to hire kind of CEOs or, you know, to be CEOs as they're thinking about this, almost like I'm a board member of their company. They're one person company that's kind of contracting for Gumroad or something like that. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I, how I 
kind of keep tabs on things. In terms of how long it takes, honestly, not a ton. I generally spend a few hours on Mondays and then a, a few hours on Fridays. And of course, I kind of hop in in between then. But I think in terms of the essentials, it's probably just a few hours a week in terms of making sure everyone has feedback on their ideas, you know, anything that is urgent or any meetings I might have with like some partner uh, I can do, you know, it probably less than 10 hours a week. And then obviously I, I work more than that. Um, uh, but I spend most of that time on kind of like optional kind of R and D I would say, right. Like talking to creators, learning about, you know, crypto, um, um, hiring, um, you know, R and Ding like a totally new product, like exploring, like a new thing we could do. Um, a lot of kind of non essential, but I think in terms of if Gumroad, you know, is relevant 10 years from now, things that are going to be incredibly important. And I actually think the founders and CEOs that are spending 40, 50, 60 hours a week, you know, managing people, like I kind of think of that as almost a failure, right? Like it's kind of like, well, you need that free time and space in your mind to go out and think about these ideas, right? Because uh, you have to be innovating. You have to be, you know, there's new technology coming out all the time. And if you don't, if you're spending all your time just managing your, your folks and making sure they're being productive, you're, it's, it's likely that I think your company will kind of stagnate eventually. Right. Um, and I also think like the best employees, like they don't want to be managed deeply. Right. Or, or maybe that's not true. Maybe it depends on the types of people, but at least the people that we kind of hire, like they're, they're, they're kind of, you know, when I say, Hey, I'm in Mexico city for four days and I have a book launch, I'm not going to be online for a while. You know, I think they're like, awesome. <laughs> We can, we can do our work, we can ship Gumroad and we can kind of manage ourselves and, you know, you'll come back and see all the cool stuff that we've done. And so, um, you know, that's a lot better than maybe saying, hey, I'm going to be gone. I'm going to be checking Slack every two hours. So, you know, blah, blah, blah. you know, just like that just generally, I don't know, at least for me personally, like I don't like those kinds of working environments. So I try to kind of avoid them. You know, ultimately the question I always ask is what's the kind of company that I would work for, right? And I was an early employee at Pinterest, so I kind of know what are the kinds of things that people want? And, you know, people like me, we want autonomy, we want freedom, we want the ability to make our own decisions, and then we want feedback so that we can improve. But we don't want to be micromanaged. We don't really want to be told what to do. We don't really like busy work. We hate meetings. You know, I, I hate meetings. Like, you know, we don't do meetings at Gumroad. And um, that saves me a ton of time, you know, alone. Um, and, and, you know, we don't even have calendars. No one knows when I work, right? Um, uh, and I think that's really healthy. I think moving to that kind of format especially when you have kids or you're traveling or in a bunch of different time zones, I think that's going to be, be become a very like 10 years from now, we're going to look back and be like, wait, what? Like everyone was required to work at the same time, like a sports team. <laughs> you know, like that's weird. <laughs> you know, I think uh, it comes down to we'll see, how we'll people perceive a business is okay. People, I think, I think people, people who have never been an entrepreneur, they think of a business and they think of some kind of big structure with, things in it that they don't understand their lawyers and everything. But really I, I would say like it just, it's, I would say Gumroad is, I don't know how, it, what it is, but it's probably like some software on GitHub, you managing <laughs> it, some people writing the software and maybe one guy who, you know, runs the whole accounting and legal part. Or could you tell us more, more about that? Yeah. Yeah. And this, this really kind of fits into this sort of this idea of minimal entrepreneurship, right? Where a lot of people, you're totally right. Like have this idea that running a business is like a bunch of lawyers and finance and operation and tax and paperwork and payroll. And, uh, and it's really not like, yeah, when I, when I tell Gumroad, you know, we're like, you know, we're sort of over 10 million in annualized revenue and you're totally, you, you nailed it. It's a GitHub repository. It's a bunch of code hosted on, you know, on GitHub. We deploy it to Amazon, right? AWS. Mm -hmm. We use Figma for all of our internal design mocks. We use Notion for all of our internal kind of operational documentation. And we use Slack for kind of our more kind of real-time-esque uh, conversations. And we use Gusto for some payroll. We use Bill.com. We have, you know, I outsource all the accounting and, and, and sort of all of that stuff to a, to a firm that we pay, you know, a few thousand dollars a month. And they kind of handle all of that complexity for me. And every Monday, I just have to kind of come in and approve, you know, just literally just go through and kind of swipe left, <laughs> and, you know, uh, and that's it, you know, and, you know, once a year we pay taxes, that's pretty important. But again, it's, you know, 
it's uh, I don't have to do that. <laughs> you know, uh, it's sort of a one time, once a year kind of thing. And, and yeah. And, and the cool thing is if you can build a product and this is kind of an idea that I wanted to communicate in the book is if you can build a product, if you can sell and market it and you can get traction and you have product market fit and you're profitable and you can maybe even have enough money to hire someone part time, all of the other stuff is not that tricky because guess what? Every business has to do it. Right. So there are accountants, there are lawyers, um, these people exist um, to, to, to solve these problems for profitable businesses. And so once you're profitable and, and you have a business and you have customers, all of this stuff is kind of easy to figure out. You know, it's not that complicated. Um, and I think uh, I worry that some people, yeah, they think that, oh, a business requires like an office <laughs> and a suit and like all the, no, Gumbar doesn't have an office. We haven't had one for six years. Um, we don't have a, you know, full-time uh, and a full-time accountant or a full-time lawyer or general counsel, like you can pay all these people a contract, which is by the way, what all these companies do, even Facebook, you know, probably has a bunch of lawyers kind of on contract, right? Um, it's, it's kind of the new way of the world in, in 2020, 2021. Um, and I think that's great. I think it's awesome. Uh, but yeah, that's it. Get, you know, Gumroad is literally, oh, you know, we have a Stripe account, I guess, to process some payments and PayPal, et cetera. But that's about it. You know, it's a very simple set of services and, if you uh, sort of tune, I have these board meetings on YouTube. If people are curious about like what goes into even running a company like this, and it's like a thirty minute, you know, like here are my revenues, here's the GMV that we process for our creators, how much, here's how much money we made, you know, like pretty simple stuff, right? Um, Gumroad was initially a weekend project, so I built it, you know, in a weekend, uh, and everything else that you know since then has just been scaling the sort of fundamental idea, right? Um, and so I would really kind of encourage people to think about it as like, yeah, a business is literally just like tiny, tiny legal structure, layer wrapper around your product, right? Um, but don't get hung up on the business part, I think. Um, I think a lot of people get stuck there and they, they think of this massive machine with tons of employees and they have to like learn all these things. And if they don't do it right, they'll go to jail, you know, like some crazy and they have to pay for some expensive office and move to a city. Like, no, you don't have to do any of that anymore. Maybe you had to do that 10, 15 years ago. You know, before back in the day when you wanted, if you wanted to sell software, you know, you'd burn it onto a CD, <laughs> you know, and then you'd have to sell it to like, you know, a retailer and they'd, they'd sell it for you. Right now you can have a Twitter account. You could use Gumroad or Stripe or, or what have you. You could sell eBooks directly and boom, guess what? You have a business, you know, um, you hire a lawyer to help, you know, or an accountant to help you, you know, pay taxes and, and do your paperwork and boom, you're good to go. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I, I really kind of encourage people to kind of really try to think about a business as like a very, very simple legal entity that all it does is accept payments and pays people and pays taxes. Right. That's basically it. Hmm. What? And this, uh, even, go ahead. Even a trillion dollar company, you know, is still a very simple kind of legal structure. And, and you see this with crypto because you've basically taken some of the fundamental things that a company does and, and, and sort of put it on the blockchain and you can see it. Oh, wow. It's like 300 lines of code. That's what a company does. <laughs> you know, oh, it's pretty, so pretty since crazy. Since you touched the topic of crypto, when is Gumroad going to start accepting crypto? You know, as soon as it makes sense, I'm watching it really, really, really closely. Um, and I'm a big crypto fan myself, uh, even though every once in a while Gumroad's account will, re you know, tweet about NFTs and get canceled for the 10th time. <laughs> <laughs> But, See, uh, well, like, cancel culture people are like 1% and you can tell that because they just make a lot of noise and every time I get quote unquote canceled, I lose like 100 followers of 200,000, <laughs> but my mentions will be full of all of these people. Oh yeah. So these I people think are not your customers. It's, it's yeah, it's a job. You're totally correct. You're, you're, they're not customers. And um, yeah, I mean, honestly, like I just think that there's just too many right now. There's still, you know, there's still. You know, for example, like, you know, with Ethereum, at least there's gas costs that are too high. You know, you can't really buy like an ebook for 10 bucks using Ethereum right now. Um, you know, there's now Bitcoin and like the like, kind of like the lightning, lightning network that I think is interesting. Stripe just announced that they're kind of building a new crypto team that used to support Bitcoin. They kind of deprecated it in 2015 when it didn't really get enough traction because it turns out like a lot of people want to accept crypto because <laughs> everyone wants to have crypto, crypto. Um, which is which is awesome. Uh, but not very many people want to pay with crypto because they, you know, there's the sort of famous stories of, you know, buying two pizzas with, you know, a thousand Bitcoin and, you know, hmm. et cetera, et cetera. I don't so think, I think that's, that's true. I don't think that's true. And I'll tell you why I think that. Sure. sure. 
And that's because I accept payments in crypto. And the way I do it is that people will pay me in crypto and then I'll send them a 100% discount link from Gumroad. And I happen to do this a couple of times. How do they pay you? What like what cryptocurrencies are they? They pay me generally? usually via uh, something like Monero or Bitcoin Cash or even Bitcoin and Ethereum. Tron, oh, all of these like cheaper cryptocurrencies that don't make you, you know, break the bank to do a transaction. Yeah, I, I actually think like, you know, Solana and I'm watching that project pretty closely um, because I think if you can, I think eventually someone will crack the problem of like, you know, making it super quick, super easy, low transaction fees. Uh, and decentralized. And, and, and uh, yeah, of course, of course, you know, a essential kind of component of this is decentralized. And um, and we will be like, I, you know, I, 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 we will be one of the first uh, when it when it when it makes a lot of sense to do it. I think we'll, we will be one of the first. And of course, a lot of people ask about NFTs similar, like I'm a huge fan of NFTs. I own some myself. I've minted some myself. We have some projects in the works. Um, and again, you know, we will almost definitely support it at some point in the future. Um, and hopefully we will be one of the first uh, to do it uh, when it makes when it makes sense. I think the other thing is, as, as you know, just to kind of as a counterpoint, like the, you know, being a U.S. based company, it, it's a little dangerous sometimes to get into crypto. Like it's almost better like almost start a new company that's only doing crypto stuff um, because you just sometimes don't want to expose yourself to that regulatory, you know, sort of liability, right? For example, like when, when, you know, a, a Gumroad creator signs up, you know, that we have to kind of do KYC, we have to collect all their information, like our banking partners kind of require that. A lot of it is stupid, to be honest, right? These are old, stupid rules, but, you know, I'd rather follow them than be in jail. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, but uh you know, crypto, you can kind of do a lot of this stuff without knowing who anyone is. And I, and I think that's great. Personally, I think that's where the world is headed. headed. I think that's kind of inevitable. Um, but, you know, I also am a, you know, a U.S. citizen and I, I need to be a little careful as well. And and so, you know, maybe maybe the answer is like we build like a totally new product, right? That's just crypto, right? It's like Gumroad for crypto um, or Gumroad for NFTs or something. Or maybe it's a totally new company. I don't even know. Um but I'm, I'm very, you know, I spend a, a, a large amount of my time talking about crypto, uh, thinking about crypto and talking to people in crypto and investing even in crypto. So I, I'm very bullish generally. So I, it seems like an inevitability um, and it can't, can't, it can't come fast enough because I'll tell you, I hate credit cards. I hate chargebacks. I hate the 3% fees. I hate the 30 cent interchange. Like credit cards suck, especially for merchants. They really, really suck. Um, so I think a lot of people want it to change. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of people also don't want it to change. Uh, and so, you know, but, but I do think that ultimately the, the decentralized uh, crypto stuff will, will win uh, long term. Interesting. So I, what you said makes a lot of sense. And yeah, given that your shoes are someone that you're a U.S. citizen, you have to follow the law there. Okay, cool. I do want to, I, since you had mentioned this a bit earlier, you said that you made Gumroad over a weekend. And that sounds really incredible to me, like such a big software, you made it over a weekend. So how does that work? So because when I look at it now, I see so many features, so many ways to host products. I see Gumroad Discover. How did you create all of that so fast? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, so definitely there's a lot more. <laughs> it's been uh, 10 years since then. So we've, we've definitely, hopefully done a lot. Um, and so, you know, Gumroad is definitely a much more, complicated, sophisticated product than it was 10 years ago when I built it initially. Um, and you can, by the way, like if you, if, and you can link kind of link this in the show notes, but if you just Google Gumroad V1, you can find the original source code and all the Git commits from April, 2011. Um, and so, Wait, you know, let me put that in the chat then so that I remember Gumroad V1. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And it's, uh, but, you know, initially, like sort of, and you can, you know, if you go to archive.org, you can kind of find an old screenshot of the homepage as well. But it was basically you created an account with a, you know, you, an email and a password. And, you know, that's not too hard to do. Uh, most people, I think, with some Ruby Rails background can figure that out pretty, you know, in an, an hour or so. And then you create products, which is also pretty simple, right? Simple database, you know, table with with products, which is just name, description, price, um, you know, in cents, uh, and then it was, you know, basically we generate these almost like bit.ly links, right? Like gum.co, you know, or at that point, gumroad.com forward slash L forward slash, you know, one, two, three, four, et cetera. And then that page would have a credit card form. It would display the name and the description that was entered. And it would, you know, use Stripe to, to have a credit card form in line as well. 
and a pay button. And then when you paid, you know, we would basically just redirect to the file, right? I forgot that part. When you create the product, you have to say, well, where's, what are you paying for, right? What files do you get access to? And then it would just do a redirect to that. You know, once we approved your payment, we would redirect. And that was like the MVP. And actually the thing that is missing from this is, well, how do creators actually get paid, right? Because all this money is flowing into Gumroad's Stripe account. And the way that I did that was I would get paid via Stripe. And then I would move that money manually to PayPal. And then I would manually literally do a database query, figure out how much everyone is owed, and then just pay every single person out manually one by one with PayPal once a month. And then I would go into, you know, every time I did that, I would go into the database and reset their balance to zero, right? And literally, like, do I recommend doing that? To start, yeah, right? Like, you can you can kind of uh, do a lot of this stuff manually at first, and then over time, you can kind of automate, scale it, uh, hire, so, you know. Now we have a much more sophisticated thing, but, you know, engineers much smarter than me are, are in charge of that kind of stuff. So what you're saying is that you first built a product that worked and solved the problem, and then you figured out how to make it better, and you added all the frills and the features to it. But the initial was just something quickly done to test the idea. Exactly. And I think the the important thing, at least for me, is like, I always go back to this, like, how can I, how can I, how can I know that I've created something valuable, even if it's a tiny, tiny amount of value? And I think the best way is to charge money, right? Is to say it's five bucks. It's 10 bucks, it's $1, any amount of money. Um, it's more about the friction than even the the, the dollar amount. Uh, and I think that's, yeah, I think that's what I think about. If I can figure out, if I can build something that's slightly valuable in a weekend and have some credit card form somewhere so they can pay me for whatever service or product that is, then I can build, you know, Gumroad now does discount codes and analytics and how we have mobile apps and a library and discover and like, you know, tons of different payment options and payout mechanisms and blah, blah, blah. And like all this crazy cool stuff that's coming down the pipeline. And, um, you know, we'll build circle integration and Slack, you know, we'll automate a lot of this stuff for, you know, community people and a lot. I mean, you know, to be honest, like Gumroad, we have so much more to do. Right. So even, even, <laughs> even today I'm like, wow, we've bar- barely done anything. Right. So I think a lot of people like, they're like, Oh, one more feature, one more feature, one more feature. Um, but I really think it's better to start small, pick a really tiny idea, make sure that you've actually solved a real problem, start charging money, and then you can build all the features in the world, right? Um, but I think you should do that after you've launched, not before. Hmm. So you recommend charging money right away instead of giving people a free trial at launch to acquire more users? Yeah, I think this is maybe like a contentious kind of topic. I think a lot of people say, well, no, you shouldn't charge money for, you know, you should try to like really get as many users as possible early and you're going to prevent people from actually signing up and getting to love and use the product. And certainly there's kind of a freemium model that Fred Wilson has kind of written a lot about. Um, But I do think even if you have a freemium product, you should still have the meme product part, right? (laughs) Like you should still have some paid component um, and it, maybe it's even as simple as like a Stripe invoice link, right? Like just a, or even like, here's my PayPal address, you know, PayPal me 20 bucks and I'll do this for you, right? Like just some way for people to opt into paying you because the truth is like people have money, they have some amount of money. And if you're providing a valuable service and you're able to save them time or make them money or save them money, they should pay for you. You know, they should pay for that service, I think. Um, and I think this is a really healthy thing. Even when I started making iPhone apps, I wasn't making free iPhone apps and trying to get a million users. I, you know, I would make like a little app. I would charge like one ninety nine for it, and I'd you know make a few thousand sales. And um, yeah, maybe you know it would have been nice to have millions of users, and it would have felt really good. But that's also like a lot of pressure, <laughs> you know. Like I think one nice thing about charging is you really get to know your customers. You feel accountable to them. Um, and you can kind of really solve their problems one by one, make sure you have product market fit. And then you can growth hack, you can try to acquire thousands and thousands of users, you can have a free plan, blah, blah, blah. But I think you really want to make sure that you what you've built is actually valuable, I think, before you do that, right? Otherwise, I think you're going to spend all your time and effort and 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 maybe even you know, advertising dollars, etc., trying to get all these thousands and thousands of users, but then they, they, they all sign up for the product. And then, you know, a month later, none of them are using it anymore. Uh, they all churned because they don't actually find that much value in it. So you have to kind of be careful. I think there are a lot of these 
you know, you see this all day with like product hunt, right? Like every day there's like, I don't know, dozens and dozens of projects launching on product hunt. Most of them are free. And you know, how many of them, you know, a month later are active? I don't know, but my guess is not very many of them. Right. Hmm. So do you recommend people run say advertisements or do you recommend organic marketing initially? Initially, I recommend organic marketing. And the, the reason is advertising is very expensive. It's very inefficient. It's kind of like blasting the same image or piece of text in front of, you know, lots and lots and lots of people. And obviously it works, but I think it works the better, you know, the, the more you know your audience, the more you know who is going to pay and find value in your service, the more specific your ads can actually be, right? And so I think the more organic marketing you can do, the more sort of the less you can actually spend on advertising to get the same ROI because you you can say hey Facebook I don't need to target everybody who lives in India I can just target the people who live in India who go to the gym three times a week right and boom like your advertising costs are going to be a tenth of the cost because you're just speaking this you know and maybe you can even go more narrow weightlifting at the gym boom you know a third of that right um, and so yeah I think I I always like. I, I get, you know, I always advise people not to spend money until they've made money. Uh, you know, you don't want to build a habit of starting to spend a bunch of money um, on stuff. And then all of a sudden you, you know, you've tried to ship three or four products and none of them have worked because the truth is like, it's not really how much money you've spent or advertising that's getting you to a successful business or not. Right. It's not like if you look at Uber, Airbnb, Stripe, and like really any company, Gumroad, et cetera, like it's not like we got really good at advertising and that's you know, uh, how we found success. It's like generally what you find is we built a product and we kind of pitched it one by one and we made sure that it worked for those people. And by the way, it didn't, right? Like there was a lot of feedback first. There were a lot of bugs. And then once we felt like, okay, we have something that works, then we started investing even in organic marketing. And I think even today we barely do or do almost zero, maybe do zero literally uh, paid marketing um, because we find that like the best, marketing for us is just our creators using the product and telling other folks about it. And, and if people are doing that, like why pay money? Right? Like it seems to work. Um, and not to say we won't ever do it. And certainly there, it may, may, may make sense to in the future. And it, it may depend on what kind of product you're building and the price point and, and these sorts of things. But I don't think it's a, it's a necessity. I think there are plenty of businesses that, and you know, there's this fam- famous article that came out about, I think it was Airbnb where obviously the pandemic kind of took them out for six months and they, they paused all of their advertising spend or something. And they, there was something like $60 million uh, a year. Yeah. And they saw, they saw almost zero. I think they literally saw zero change in their, in their, any of their metrics. Right. And so that's what can happen when you get really comfortable spending money on ads because everybody else is spending money on ads is you kind of do it. You don't really measure you don't really know. And then you turn it all off and you're like, wait a second, we just spent $60 million a year last 10 years. Like for what? <laughs> See, I'll That's a lot of money. How, so. I'll tell you how I found Gumroad. I found Gumroad because someone else was using it to sell. And at the bottom, it said powered by Gumroad. And at that point I had, I think six, 7,000 followers. So I thought maybe I should try building a product and selling it here and maybe people will pay for it. And people did pay for it. And that's how I made life math money from a hobby to a business. Exactly. And it's it's amazing. And, you know, the, the beauty of charging money for something is not necessarily so you can go buy a Tesla, right? It's so that you can take that money and you can reinvest it and you can improve your product offering. You can improve your own life, of course. But I think a lot of this sort of most successful people I find is like, oh, they're like, oh, I made a thousand bucks. Awesome. I can go hire like a graphic designer to, you know, in, in, or a copy editor or a marketer or someone to help me, you know, do this thing or do that thing. And, and so I think if you can charge money for something, you can basically funnel that back into the business, which makes you grow even faster. And then you can funnel that back into the business. And, and that's the creators who I see really do really, really well on Gumroad. They have that mindset, right? It's not like they make a thousand bucks and then they, uh, you know, they just sort of spend it all on alcohol or whatever, right? Like generally the people who are very successful, are the ones who who are really kind of living the same kind of life day to day, um, but then they kind of reinvest all of that capital into their business. Um, and you know, when you do that, you know, your dollars can go very, very, very far, right? Like I would much rather invest a thousand dollars into my own business than you know buy a thousand dollars worth of some public company stock, right? Because I know that 
yeah, maybe that public company stock will go up 10% this year. But I know that if I start a business, I can take that thousand bucks and turn it into 10,000 bucks, right? Um, and learn along the way, right? Um, and so it's like the ROI on on spending money on your own business is just like 100x, 1,000x better than, you know, I started Gumroad with, you know, it's worth, you know, $100 million or so now. I started it with like, you know, 10 bucks, right? So what's the ROI on on 10 bucks? Uh, you know, 10,000 X, right? Like that's kind of like if you invested in Bitcoin in 2009, you know, um, or so like maybe not in 2011, I think. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's crazy, but, um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's like insider trading, right? You know, your business better than anybody else. Um, and so you can make these sorts of bets that nobody else can make. Right. Um, and so I think it's really important to, if you really want to kind of get to the next, you know, the sort of 10x your your kind of income and 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 get to a place where you know you can kind of really exit whatever life situation you you may be in. Interesting and makes sense. I will say that, you know, now that you mentioned that you started with only 10 bucks, I would say mm -hmm. nowadays, do you think do startups need VC money anymore? Because if you can make a company that you're charging money for your product and you don't even need that much money to start. So you don't really require funding, do you? Totally. You know, there's probably some businesses that do, uh, right? Like if you're building a boat or some product, you know, a hardware kind of product. But yeah, I, I, I would kind of tell everyone, like, don't do that as your first company, right? <laughs> like Elon, right? He, yeah, of course, he has a couple, you know, hardware companies that require billions and billions of dollars in funding. But he started with like a file sharing tool, I think, called Zip2. You know, and then he did PayPal. So like two software companies first. Um, why? Because it's a lot easier to start a software company than a hardware company. And he knew that, right? Even if he maybe wanted to do a car, I don't know what, it, you know, what he was thinking about back then. Um, but yeah, start, start with something that doesn't need venture capital. Um, I think that gives you a lot more leverage. Um, it means that you don't have to get sort of seek their permission because frankly, you know, it's not like these people are amazing savants who can are just like geniuses and can help you know no they're wrong all the time uh you don't want to rely on them uh for your success um and so yeah totally pick a business that doesn't require any venture funding which is basically any software business the only real cost i think you should have in the early days is like the domain name right like that's like the single cost that that most businesses i start have is just the domain name everything else figma is free notion is free slack is free like you can do all of these things for free, uh, which is amazing. Uh, it's amazing, amazing time, which wasn't possible even five years ago. Uh, and once you have money coming in the bank, then you can start investing in 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 all of these you know different costs that you you know you you may want to invest in. Um, but yeah, it's totally like you really don't and you don't you really don't need venture funding. And I, the last thing I'd say is like you know people have seen a lot of the valuations of these companies go up a lot, and I think that's because you don't actually don't need venture capital. Right? Because effectively, these venture capitalists, and I can say, say this kind of being one myself, the only way we can convince you to take our money is by giving you a better and better deal over time. Because you don't need us. You truly don't need me anymore. And so you're only going to take my money if, it's, if I'm giving you a really, really good deal. And that's why I think you're seeing a lot of these, these startup valuations kind of go through the roof. Um, and it's not going to, I really don't believe it's going to go back down because it's only going to get easier and cheaper. And, you know, you're going to be able to do more with less every year that goes on, right? Uh, and so I don't really see that. And I, by the way, I think that's great. It makes my life harder as an investor. Like I don't, it's not like I like it, but I think it's great because as a founder, I think it's awesome that I have more leverage and I don't have to raise more money and I don't have to sell a part of my company. And, uh, you know, cause ultimately raising money sounds sexy, but what are you really doing? You're selling a part of your company, right? That's the other side of that equation. Someone might join your board. Uh, there are these really big decisions that you may not sign up for. Uh, you may want to, right? Let's say you have really clear product market fit and you say, hey, I really believe that with an extra few million bucks, we could hire these engineers and build this product to, you know, our two year roadmap we can do in six months or a year. Um, and so, you know, I'm not saying don't ever raise VC, uh, but I do think if you are able to kind of get to product market fit, get to profitability, know your customer, all of these things, when you do go out and try to raise money, you will have a much easier time of it. Right. But if you're just starting out, even with Gumroad, when I was able to raise money, that was because I had that project. I had the weekend project. I had Gumroad.com. You could visit it. You could go to it. You can sign up. You could sell something and you could make a dollar. And, you know, VCs saw that and were like, holy crap, you actually 
they see all of these pitches of people who have ideas and I had a product. And that was enough for a lot of VCs to say yes to giving me, you know, a million, the first round of funding was a million and one, you know, $1.1 million. And that was it. I thought, mul- you know, multiple investors even told me, yeah, the reason we, we gave you money is because you actually built what you said you built. <laughs> you know, most people, and I'm like, it's literally a weekend. So a weekend turned into $1.1 million, which I, you know, have since taken to, to, to build this company and do a lot more cool stuff with. And so, you know, a weekend. I mean, that's a pretty, you know, pretty high ROI. <laughs> um, so was Gumroad your first weekend pro- uh, project or did you have other weekend projects before this? I've, I've had a few. Yeah. So, you know, the first thing I actually remember building was a thing called Twitter, which was like, you know, how Facebook has the wall to wall conversations or at least used to, right? Where you could see kind of people talking back and forth, two friends. Mm-hmm. So before Twitter had at replies uh, officially, um, and, you know, now obviously you can just tap a tweet and you can see the thread you know, Twitter was kind of incompetent for a while. So they didn't actually have that feature for like the first five years of the company or something. And so I built like a a really basic app that basically you type in a tweet URL and then it just generates this like wall to wall kind of conversation back and forth. You know, nothing crazy. Like, is that, you know, is that a startup? No. You know, would I ever raise money or sell? No, but like I learned stuff through doing that. I learned the Twitter API and, you know, I got some Twitter followers that way because people who use Twitter use the tool and followed me because my Twitter handle was in the footer, you know, uh, things, things like that. So that was one of the first things I built. I remember building a note taking app. I built an iPhone app that allowed you to call a cab on your phone pre Uber. Um, just, just tons and tons of projects. Gumroad was probably the, like the 10th or maybe or so project that I built that I, that I got sort of far along enough that I was like, Oh wow, there's something here. Um, and the reason I got so excited specifically about Gumroad is because it was financially empowering to other people. All of these other products were cool, but none of them were really unlocking like a new generation of founders, creators, entrepreneurs. Uh, and Gumroad was one where I was like, holy crap, what Apple and the iPhone and the App Store did for me, Gumroad can do for others. And so that's really kind of what got me to say, I need to quit my job at Pinterest uh, and start this company and, and see what happens. Hmm. So it looks like you were building products to solve your own problems. And at some point you found a product that might solve other people's problems. Yeah, that's, that's a good way to think about it, right? There's a Venn diagram of the one circle is, you know, problems you have. And then, you know, there's another circle, which is problems that enough other people have that it's worth building a business for. And you kind of want to find the intersection of that, right? You want to find the problem, you know, ideally you have the problem because, and especially in the early days, I would almost say ignore the second circle, just focus on your own problems. Even if you're literally, you think you're the only person on planet earth that has this problem, which by the way, is very unlikely. Um, you know, you're, you're not a sort of a super special, uh, snowflake, uh, you know, uh, I unfortunately. That to people on Twitter and- <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, just saw, you know, and, and the re the reason too, the reason I think it's so important is because the feedback loop is instant, right? You can solve your own problem and you should know, are you actually solving your own problem or not? And you can actually get really good at solving your own problem. And then once you get good at solving your own problem, then you can go solve other people's problems for them, right? But I think it takes a pretty high level of competence to be able to do that on behalf of other people. Um, and ideally, you're doing it for both. You're, you're finding the circle, the intersection between things you want to do and things other people need and will pay for. And luckily, there's plenty, you know, there's plenty of stuff in that middle ground, right? It's absolutely, absolutely massive. There's certainly products and services you can build um, that solve your own problem and also solve a problem for enough people that you can build a very, very great, great business um, with. What do you think of products that already exist? So I read a book called Zero to One by Peter Thiel, and he recommends doing something that's completely new. What are your thoughts on building a better alternative to something that's already in the market? Because even for Gumroad, I think there are alternatives that used to exist before, or was Gumroad the first one? Yeah, I think, you know, I, the, my joke on the sort of the Peter Thiel zero to one, and I, I think it's a, it's a great book that everybody should read. Uh, I, I sort of say, you know, the, the, before you, you try to go zero to one, you should try to go zero to $1, right? Like try to make your first dollar on the internet. Um, and learn those sorts of skills. Because what I found is the people who do build, again, with Elon, with Zip2 to Tesla, you know, with the Collison brothers, they had a company pre-Stripe that was, you know, automatic, sold for $5 million, I think, to eBay or something like that. Um, like, 
it's very rare that someone, their first thing, they just boom, like knock it out of the park. Even Facebook, right? Like Zuck had that hot or not thing, right? Like, and he probably had a bunch of other projects before that, that, you know, are less well known. Um, so I think you have to learn the skills, right? It's very unlikely that, you know, you are learning the f- sort of fundamental skills of business building and software development. And you have like a $10 billion company on your hands, right? Like it's just statistically unlikely. Um, and so instead you should just, in my view, focus on zero to one. And yeah, you know, that probably means taking an existing business. Like for example, with Gumroad, there was a service called eJunkie, which was, well, I've used you know, that before. yeah. And it's, you know, you, you, you can say, you know, oh, Gumroad was like a copycat or a clone of eJunkie or whatever. You know, we had our own take on it. Um, I felt it was different enough that I wanted to kind of build a separate business. For example, eJunkie was reliant on PayPal and I wanted to not be reliant on PayPal. Um, you know, eJunkie required you to have a website to embed a button. Um, and, and sort of the other pushback I would maybe give to Peter Thiel is like, it's very like, what's the line between something that's completely new, right? Like Stripe is a hundred billion dollar company. They didn't do anything new. They took Braintree and PayPal and some of these other, you know, obviously you were able to accept credit card payments on the internet before Stripe, but they just made it better. Hopefully a lot better, but they just made it better. And now they basically, you know, it, it seems like the writing's on the wall, like Stripe is going to be a monopoly at some point in the future, Right. Um, and so I, I think you can totally, you know, Uber, you know, sort of replaced the cabs, Airbnb replaced hotels. And so I do, I, I think the important thing about at least my takeaway from zero to one was eventually you want there to be a possibility that this can become a monopoly, right? That there are powerful enough network effects that it makes sense to have like one Tesla instead of five Teslas or one Stripe instead of five Stripes or one Facebook instead of five Facebooks, et cetera. Um, and so I think it is healthy if you really do want to build that kind of scale business to think about that, right? Like the greater economy, for example, it doesn't seem to be a monopoly. There's Substack and Patreon and Teachable and Kajabi and Thinkific and Gumroad and all of these other services, right, as well. Um, and so maybe if you were trying to build a $10 billion company, yeah, you probably shouldn't build for this greater economy. It seems like this, you know, very uh, sort of non, and maybe that's good. Maybe it's good that it's not a monopoly, right? Um but yeah, you know, I, I think very, there are very few monopolies. I, I do think that the sort of takeaway for me was, you know, ultimately you, you want to end up in a place with very, very, very powerful network effects so that sort of your monopoly is almost self-sustaining, right? It's not anti-competitive. It just makes sense for the users um, and your customers. Um, and, but yeah, I, 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 the other thing I would say about Teal is like, look, like obviously companies like Facebook and Uber and Apple and Google and, you know, Amazon, et cetera, are awesome, right? Like they've done so much for the world. Uh, you know, I don't think billionaires are evil or any of that sort of stuff. Uh, but there's, there's just not that many of those. Right. And so, you know, I would rather empower people to build businesses that give them financial freedom. Uh, Naval had that tweet a while ago and it ended with save yourself, which stuck with me. Um, you know, it's like, you know, ultimately like a trainer is not going to make you fit, right? You have to make, you have to get yourself fit. And so I always remind myself, well, what is my goal? My goal is to help people get free um, to save themselves. Um, and by the way, you don't need a billion dollars to do that, right? Like uh, you might need, you know, a side hustle. 10 bucks uh, and a domain. Exactly. You can start really, really small. And, and I, th- you know, I think what will happen is, you know, maybe I take, you know, Gumroad is a great business and I say, hey, we want to build a totally new crypto product. And we can do that because we have our team and we are profitable and we can take risks. Um, and so, you know, I think some of the best ways to take these big shots is to actually be in a place where you can afford to take them. Um, and I think the sort of Peter Thielian approach is like, have an idea, have a really strong sort of vision, raise tons and tons and tons of capital and sort of, you know, kind of almost work backwards from where you want to be and just kind of convince the world that this thing needs to exist. And I just think that, that that's, you know, ultimately like Peter Thiel invests in a hundred companies. So like, if even if one of them works, it works. the The business model works out for him. But I think for for ninety nine of those founders, it doesn't they're work for the mac. It doesn't work on a macro scale. Basically, it works for some people. Exactly. So exactly. What, exactly. What books would you recommend people read outside of yours, which is coming out tomorrow, <laughs> of course? Yes. Yeah. Check mine out. Um, I you know uh, one I, I would say a look link to Sahil's book in the description. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I, I like the, you know, the almanac of Naval Ravikant, I think is a really good, a really good one. It has a lot of sort of similar ideas and concepts. Um, it's a little bit more higher level. Um, I really like how to win friends and influence people, tribal leadership. 
um, is a really great book. I like a lot of books on kind of management and, and how do you kind of build a company and, and organize people. Um, uh, uh, I really like reading about early, like the sort of origin stories of companies. Uh, so for example, the everything store, um, uh, you know, about Amazon or in the Plex about Google or the PayPal wars. It's phenomenal. Uh, the PayPal wars is actually, I think written by a PayPal co-founder. Most of these other books, you know, the problem is you're kind of, they're kind of journalistic, right? They're they're which is fine, I think, but, but, you know, but like, I kind of like the inside story. Like I want, a, you know, I want someone who was on, on the ground writing about it. And so uh, the PayPal Wars was actually written by a, a PayPal co-founder, um, which I think is really cool. Um, I recently read E-Boys, which is kind of about benchmark capital and kind of the early days of venture capital in the 70s. Um, and then I read a lot of science fiction, right? I think a lot of my ideas and thoughts come from reading fiction. Uh, so, you know, the Foundation series by Isaac Asimov, I'm a big fan of. Uh, Stranger from a Strange Land uh, is a great book for me. Um, Ishmael is Dune, you know, just, it gets me thinking about, and uh, you know, part of it is just, I get excited about the future, right? Like I find that if I can get excited about the future, if I can get optimistic about what does the world look like in a hundred years, uh, are there space factories? Are we going to Mars? Like, what does that look like? Then I get excited about contributing to that, you know, to that journey of humanity. But if I think the world's ending tomorrow and climate change is going to destroy everything and blah, 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 then like, what's the point? <laughs> You know, uh, like I yeah, should just have fun and travel and, and get fat and die. But so I think it's, it's healthy, you know, it's, it's good to read books that kind of get you more, you know, Matt Ridley has these phenomenal books. Uh, Rational Optimist is kind of his famous one, but he has a bunch of really great ones. He has a great one on biology called the Red Queen, which is kind of controversial. Um, hey, so if yeah, it's read, controversial read, read is good. Yeah. You don't want to read a non-controversial book, right? It's a sign um, of like, quality. You, you, yeah, it, it is. It totally is. So let's hope your book becomes a bit controversial, especially now that you've been on the most controversial podcast on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully, you know, the best thing, the best thing that could happen for this book is if I get canceled tomorrow, right? So we'll see what happens. <laughs> you know, I don't think that cancel culture people are creators. I don't think it would affect you at all. Like, no, it's a totally, it's a totally different group of people. I think people who spend their time criticizing are, you know, it's kind of, a, it, it is zero sum in that way, in the sense that you are either creating something or you are criticizing somebody. It's very hard to do both at the same time. Uh, so I think, yeah, if you're, if you're criticizing, you're kind of implying, you're telling the world that you're not a creator, you're not a builder and, you know, uh, fine, but uh, we're probably not going to be good friends. I've been meaning to ask you, what kind of products work best on Gumroad? Which products do you think sell most? And what factors have you noticed increase people's sale on Gumroad? And I ask this because I have I have about five, six hundred friends on Twitter who use Gumroad. So they've asked me this question before. I've been asked this question like six or seven times now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, ultimately, I you know, I'll go back to like, you know, saving people time saving people money. No, I mean, people no, if someone is a creator already, he has a product listed. What gotcha. factors do you think play a role in increasing his sales? Yeah. I mean, ultimately I think a lot of it comes down to how engaged are your fans, right? Like ultimately it's about these people you, you, you need, it's not about necessarily like how many followers you have. Like I've had people use Gumroad who have millions of followers on Twitter, you know, over 10 million actually. And make almost no money because it turns out that all those people don't really care about that person. And so I think it's about building deep relationships, producing a lot of content, creating a lot of value for them. And, and then, you know, you, sort of the sales of your product. Daniel Vasallo does this really, really, really well, where he just like tweets about his like Twitter book like every once every like two or three months or something. And he does super, super well uh, because he's just constantly providing value. And I think there are a lot of people who, who kind of are just selling their product Right. Uh, but I think it's, and, and it's tempting because you want to make money eventually. Right. But, but I think if you can sort of turn off or turn down that, that sort of desire and say, I'm just going to focus on creating value, creating content, producing higher quality content, higher fidelity quant content, not just tweeting, but maybe doing YouTube stuff, you know, doing Twitter threads, you know, writing blog posts, you know, uh, investing in those sorts of things. Uh, that's the stuff that will generally, I think, pay off pay off in the long term. I think the other thing is to kind of have a portfolio of products eventually. Like I think a lot of people may have one thing and that that does work, but I find that it's it's better to have almost like what I call first class, second, you know, business class and economy class tickets, 
right? Where you have like kind of like the entry product, let's say it's 10 bucks, then you have like the intermediate, let's say that's a, you know, an, an ebook, right? Or something like that. Uh, then you have like the middle class product, which is maybe like a course, like a self-directed course or something like that. And then you have like the high class kind of first class, you know, ticket, which is kind of like your cohort based course or coaching or consulting uh, sort of calls. And, you know, for example, like, um, you know, applying this to like fitness, right? You might have like the the fitness ebook, right? Which is like 19 bucks. Then you have like the fitness course, which is like, you know, 190 bucks. And then you have like a, you know, a, you know, coaching class, which is 190 bucks an hour, right? Um, and that's really, you can almost think of it like your ebook drive sales to your course and your course drive sale to your consulting. And I even see this, by the way, with books where you write a book and, you know, like, you know, my book, for example, will be, you know, 10 to 20 bucks or, or whatever it may be on Amazon or what have you. Um, and then, you know, I might do, you know, courses, uh, you know, I might do, you know, I might speak at some conference uh, or some company or, or what have you. Um, and, you know, it'll be a kind of a similar kind of like, you know, uh, sort of sort of three tiers of, of sort of monetization. Um, and you almost, you want that because ultimately your audience is, you know, there's some, some of your audience only has 10 bucks, right. But some of your audience, it's a small percent, but at least 1% of your audience is very wealthy. Right. Uh, and so you want to be able to kind of offer, I think a variety of products at, at a variety of price points to be able to kind of sell to all of those kinds of kinds of people, uh, who may be interested And look, like if you sell, you know, a, a thousand eBooks for 10 bucks, you know, that's the equivalent of selling 10 slots into a course. Right. Um, and so in terms of this sort of numbers game, like 10 people is a lot easier to find than a thousand. Right. Mm. Um, that makes a lot of sense. I, you know, I've also noticed certain things without even increasing your audience can increase your sales. And that is, I had a product or I still have this product, which is only making a small amount of money, but we hired a copywriter to help us write the, the copy, the actual advertisement of the product on the Gumroad page and changing that increased our sales by 10. So in, from it went from making $1 to making $10. So well, I think, do you think how much, I think that's a big factor, don't you think? I know, I think it is. And ultimately, you know, people should try things. I think a lot of people kind of just try one thing and then it doesn't work or it kind of works. And even if it works, you kind of want to keep experimenting, keep trying new things, try different price points, you know, uh, mess around with the funnel, um, you know, start an email list. Like there's all sorts of different things you can try. Um, but I think you want to keep it dynamic. I think the other thing is like, the you know, the world's changing all the time, right? There's new things happening, new social networks, new products, new ways to accept payments, crypto, et cetera, et cetera. So you want to be constantly sort of, you know, trying to find, you know, maybe this is more Peter Thielian, trying to find like the new thing that hasn't been done before, right? And becoming like the best at that specific thing, right? Like for example, when Clubhouse was blowing up, like my guess is if you were, you know, if you are the one who wrote like the sort of guide to building an audience on Clubhouse, like you might have done super, super, super well, right? Um, and, you know, maybe that would have plateaued by this point, but you would have been able to take all of those customers of which you have all their emails and then, you know, do other things with that, right? Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it is important to try things and and there's always there's always more that you can do, right? There's always more that you can do to kind of optimize. It's kind of, I, I use the analogy of drawing a perfect circle right? It's a very simple thing, but no one, no one has ever drawn a perfect circle, right? Um, you could draw a million circles and you'll get better and better and better at drawing circles, but you will never be able to draw a perfect circle. Um, and it's similar with product development and business. You can always get better and better and better. Um, but you'll never be perfect, right? You'll never get to a point, um, where you're like, I built the perfect business. I'm done. I'm done. Like, you know, no, and you, you can keep going as long as you want. There's always going to be newer, newer, cooler, cooler things that you can, you, you'll be able to do with it. So. That makes sense. Uh, by the way, Sahil, would you like to keep going or because you said that you have yeah, I, I do have to run. I do have to run. So. Okay. So we'll end the podcast. Yeah. Sounds great. All right, Sahil. So this has been a very productive conversation. I have definitely learned a lot from you and is there anything is there any final advice you would like to leave with all the people listening? Is there anything you want to say? Um, I'll just say kind of like the core message from the book, which is just start literally like, that's the thing, like, you know, get off, 
you know, Twitter is great. I spend a lot of my time on Twitter, but ultimately, you know, figure out what's the most important thing you could be doing with your time. If that's Twitter, great. But if, if it's building, if it's learning a code, if it's learning to write, if it's learning Figma, Notion, if it's doing a course and actually finishing it, just figure out what is most important to you and your, tra- your career trajectory and your life trajectory right now. And everything else is secondary to that, right? And so just focus on that. Make sure you're doing that and hold yourself accountable to doing that, right? You want to get fit? Reading fitness books is only going to get you so far, <laughs> right? You got you to gotta go to the gym. You got to go for a run or what have you. And so just make sure you're actually doing the, 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 the thing, right? Everything else is secondary to doing the thing. So make sure you know what the thing is and, and do that thing over and over again. Hmm. So I remember re- reading this quote, I think that's used in Facebook a lot. It's called having a bias for action. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Have a bias for action. I think Naval had a good tweet. He said something like, you don't need mentors, you need action, right? Um, you need feedback. And the only way you get feedback is by trying something out and, you know, getting feedback on your ideas, I guess you could do, but it's just not that, I don't know. I've never found that to be that valuable. I think what's super valuable is spending a weekend, building a product, building a prototype in Figma, and then getting feedback on that idea. And I, I find that the feedback you get when you do that is, is actually much, 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 much more. And it might even be in the form of, can I give you money for this? You know, like that's happened to many people I know. Yeah, just like, yeah, they're like, oh, I need to build a business. Like, don't, don't worry about it. Just like build a little landing page and, you know, a prototype and, 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 and see what the demand is like. And they're like, hey, this person just asked me if they can pay me money, but like, I don't actually have a product. And I'm like, yeah, isn't that cool? <laughs> Uh, but if you just got stuck building the product, you thought that you needed to do that. You would have never been able to even make that realization. And by the way, when someone asks you to make money or, you know, asks, ask you if they can give you money, um, guess what? That's very motivational, right? Th- that's, that will give you the energy, uh, to actually learn all the skills that you need to accept their money. Right now you have the kind of the pressure of that. So I see, I see. All right, Sahil. Thank you so much for being on the podcast with me and I hope it I hope everyone likes it. I think that it was pretty informational. So see you and awesome. have a good day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harsh. Talk to you later. And I'll be linking Sahil's book in the description. Please check it out. It's a pretty cool book. I flipped through it. I had a copy sent to me before the release. And I'm getting a physical copy in the mail as well. So have a look, guys. See you. Yeah.